Hello fellow detectives, welcome to Unlocked, the official podcast for all things Nancy Drew from Her Interactive. I'm your host, Tammy Tucky, and this week we welcome actress and voiceover artist Carrie Healy to the show. Welcome, Carrie. Hi, Tammy. How are you doing? Doing really well. I was just telling you off air that everybody has been asking to have you on the show. So finally, we get to have you on the show. I'm so excited. (laughs) Well, that is incredibly gratifying. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We're so glad that we could finally get to talk because we're still both recovering from colds. And I thought we'd first start to talk about your beginnings in the entertainment industry. You know, what was one of your first acting or writing jobs? Well, first, really first um, was, you know, like a lot of actors, it started in school. <laughs> well, I definitely think everything counts because I think um, what gets me started is uh, not necessarily thinking of acting as a job, but when I was a teenager, it became the place where I just blossomed personally and started to find my voice because I was a really shy kid. So I remember absolutely the most life changing acting job I had was at Naperville. High school um, in Naperville, Illinois, and um, I was such a shy kid that my speech uh, teacher basically had to force me to audition for the after-school play, and I didn't fit any of the roles when in Philadelphia Story, which is the play we're doing. So they wrote a role for me, Um, and um, you know which you can do in high school, but I don't endorse in uh, uh, real theater. This was a speech competition. They wrote a kind of a, a role for an extra maid to be that person who goes on between scenes and changes the set. And because I was very shy, they weren't sure if I could handle a real role. So they wrote this kind of small role for me. And apparently I killed it um, because after that, I started getting asked to audition for all the plays in school. Um, uh, so, it, you know, that was really exciting for me, not necessarily from um an acting excellence standpoint, but from a standpoint of first standing on stage and understanding those feelings of saying words to an audience and having them appreciate them and having them hear your story and um, being part of a cast and what that means in terms of being brought into a group of people who are all working toward a common goal. And um, so that really launched me on wanting to get serious about learning about plays and learning how to act and one by one I started doing plays in school and then eventually um, college where I got an acting scholarship to Texas Christian University because you know honestly I had applied to a bunch of colleges being scared I wouldn't get into any college and I didn't I wasn't going for theater I was going for journalism and um, but on a whim I auditioned for a, a scholarship because TCU was a a college that was close to where my family was living, um, I decided I found an available scholarship. I auditioned for it. And my thought process was, well, if I get this acting scholarship, I'm going to acting school and I'm going to study acting. But if I didn't, I would close the book on that and just go to another school and study journalism. So this was really one of those one-shot deals. I didn't audition for an acting scholarship anywhere else. Um, And I just happened to get it, and it worked out, and um, here we are. And you have such a great list here with her interactive. I hope you don't mind me running through all of the characters that you've played. (laughs) (laughs) So first we have Professor Hotchkiss from Treasure in a Royal Tower, Legend of the Crystal Skull, Tomb of the Lost Queen. And then we have Simone Mueller and Madeline from The Final Scene. We have Sally McDonald from Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. We have Paula Santos from The Haunted Carousel, Harper Thornton from Ghost of Thornton Hall, and I love all these characters. They all are completely different, so I would never know that they were you, (laughs) So, which is also perfect for your part, but when I was looking, I was just like, oh my goodness, I've heard her so many times, and Professor Hotchkiss has always been my favorite, but I love all these other fun characters you get to play, like Simone Mueller from The Final Scene is just so... (laughs) 
so tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so different yeah. and so tough. And I love that aspect. So how do you go ahead and start finding a voice for these characters? Do they show you an initial drawing or do they ask you, here's some information about the person. What do you think they sound like? Yeah, no, it usually starts with uh, just raw information. Um, you know, who this character is, she's, you know, a tough blah, 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 you know, she or she's, you know, Nancy's friend and she's trying to be helpful. You know, so they'll give you some facts about the character. Uh, eventually, um, a picture, you know, an image will come in, a still from what they think the character will look like. But actually, I didn't off, I didn't always see that that image. Um, before doing the role, it was really just a description. And then working, you know, I would come into the recording booth with some idea of where I wanted to pitch the character um, vocally, but you would always get great direction of, well, let's go stronger here, more colorful here. You know, um, a lot of times the director would often remind me, well, your last character sounded like this, so we want to make this new one so very far apart. So, either pitch your voice higher or let's go huskier. So we would, you know, play with different kind of tones in the booth until we found the role. Um, and, you know, Hotchkiss was, I can't, I think she was the first one I did. I'm trying to remember, but she was so distinct that a lot of the work was about finding um, for the other characters, something that was very different from Hotchkiss <laughs> Um and uh, so it was really about um, just getting a description of what they wanted their personality to be and what their attitude toward Nancy was. I never knew whether I was the villain or not. <laughs> no, um, that that just didn't come into play. I mean, uh, you were, you know, often when there was a decision to make on how to play a certain line or um, I would I would ask, you know, am I telling the truth here as a character or am I lying? Because it was always helpful to know in that moment um, what your character's reality was mm -hmm. or whether they're trying to cover something up because you would play it a little differently. Um, but never when I uh, did any character did I know what the full story was. Um, and it was very much um, you recorded a section, you recorded a scene without knowing the whole trajectory of your character. And in that way, it was very different from uh, acting in a play where you know where the play is going. Um, but this had to be, um, you know, your line readings had to be um, negotiable enough so that, you, like you said, if, if they wanted to take the character in a different direction um, or they wanted to leave enough mystery so that no one suspected, you didn't have too many giveaways whether your character was a villain or not. Um, but, but I think in playing any character, whether it's in a live play, whether it's serious or comic, it's important to know what the character believes to be true. So I'd always ask that question. Is my character lying or is my character telling the truth here? Did, did you ever read the Nancy Drew novels growing up? I did. I read some of them. You know, actually, I was um, really into Hardy Boys more than Nancy Drew growing up. You know, it was th that it just hit me at the right age that I was going to be, you know, interested in these cute boys. All those books were really, you know, wonderful. I still to this day love mysteries. So that kind of got me started on, um, you know, the hunt for um, you know, how to solve this problem, how to solve this mystery. So those were fantastic books to read growing up. When you first got to play one of the games, what was your initial reaction? They were hard. I mean, they were much more difficult than I thought they were. <laughs> I, I remember first um, when, you know, I would get sent a copy of the game after they were done, and, you know, it was, it was generally so long after you finished it um, uh, because post-production um, takes a long time that I, you know, got the game and it was fun to relive my, you know, of course, as any, most actors do, you look for where are the parts I'm in. I'm going to skip to those. Um, in playing the whole thing, I did it with my nieces when they were younger and they were, you know, just on top of it. And I was getting lost with all, I mean, it was, it was hard figuring things out. Um, so I thought hey, these are really challenging games. They're great. Um, so, but it was, you know, because the game itself is so much more than just what you get as an actor, the single scenes that you're reading in the booth. Um, it was fascinating to see how it got all put together because I would hear lines that I had only read on other characters' pages. 
Um, and it was great to hear the voices come alive and some of the actors I knew and others I didn't. And it was great to hear how they decided to play their characters. And, and so it, it, I think as an actor listening to the games or playing the games, you, you're struck by different things than somebody who wasn't involved in the process at all would be. Um, so that that can be a little distracting in a positive way. Um, but I, I was just overall struck by how challenging they were. And it was really gratifying to see people sort of playing quote unquote together and helping each other and that there was a community of people who really talked about these stories. I had no idea about that for a long time um, until one of the directors over at Her Interactive told me about, oh, the characters are, re- or the people who are playing are really responding to this character in this way. and. Um, but it was gratifying to know that, like, wow, people are so excited about playing these games that they're actually playing them together online. And, um, it, yeah, I think that that's a sign of a good game. And you mentioned that you know some of the voice actors from the games. You know, who in particular do you know? And have you ever gotten a chance to work in the booth with them before? You know, no, not when I was acting. Um, I did not get to um, uh, act with people because you would go in and do your sides, what they're called, um, or which are just your lines. And then the director is sitting on the other side of the glass, reading your lines to or reading the other characters lines to you and you're responding to them. Um, So in the recording process, I didn't meet other actors, but I knew um, other fellow actors who also we would suggest each other for parts. Sometimes, um, you know, I would call up her interactive. They would ask me for some suggestions for we need a young a guy who does a lot of young man voices. And and so we would suggest other actors that we knew for parts and um so Jonah Von Spreken is an actor who's on a lot of games and uh he plays a like he, I think he is probably one of the widest um uh varieties of voices because he can do any kind of voice um uh Evan Mosier was um on a game that I actually um it was a game that I um uh Castle Malloy that I d- wasn't in but I directed the voice talent for um, so, uh, there were a couple actors that I brought onto that, that, um, uh, were really fantastic. And, um, Evan Mosier does the Irish character who's really hilarious. And so, um, you know, I would meet them that way. Um, but n- not, it was always a very lonely experience in the booth. You didn't get to act with other characters, um, not that I recall. I didn't do anything with anybody else. And you mentioned voice directing. You know, how is that aspect a little bit different than covering a character itself? Because it seems like you really are in touch with all the people who are playing the different characters. So you have to work with all of them as opposed to just one. I have directed a lot of plays on stage, which is a very different experience because in a play, you are experiencing not only the actor's voice, but their facial expressions and their body. And so you're paying attention to a lot of different things. And what I discovered when I first did the auditions for actors to look for um, for the uh, Castle Malloy project, I auditioned them and I recorded their auditions. I would make a list at the end of the day of the auditions of, you know, who were my first choices, who, who really hit me very well in the audition that day. And then I would go home and listen only and not see their faces, not not. Um, be taken in with their facial expressions. And I would come up with very different decisions of who were my first choices. So it was a really good lesson for me in understanding that voice acting is a very different and completely separate skill than just acting. Um, There are uh, qualities to people's voices that might not be there on their face. And there are things you need for, um, to keep a, a, especially a like a PC game, uh, very animated, um, when, you know, the, the graphics on the Nancy Drew games aren't, aren't like, lo- like watching live actors, for example. They're, they're uh, a lot more still in many cases. Um, so the voices have to do a lot of the heavy lifting, and that's a very different experience. So it was a good lesson for me as a voice actor to feel how different it is when you can't see the actors' faces, um, because I wasn't used to that. And you've been doing a lot besides Nancy Drew. We need to we need to add and, and highlight those projects. So, what has been the most recent thing you've been working on? Well, you know, actually, I um, I haven't been actively acting for many years now. Um, I I turned to writing um, a while back, and so most of the work I do these days is as a playwright and as a director. So, um, uh, you know, I've 
I guess my most recent play that was um, uh, that I wrote and was produced was a couple years ago. It was called Torso, and right now I'm working on um, a musical actually. Um, so I'm writing a musical with a program that's happening at the Fifth Avenue Theater here in Seattle, and um, uh, we'll see how that turns out. So we're um, I'm working with a composer, and we're hoping to have a, a reading of this by the end of this year. So, um, yeah, so it's been um, less of the acting, more of the writing and directing. And and before we started, I asked, you know, I, I was I was ashamed to ask. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was just really excited to ask if you could, if we could talk a little bit to Professor Hotchkiss for a scene, if that's okay with you. I have three questions for her. So okay. would that, would that, does that sound okay? <laughs> I will try. I hope I hope she lives up to, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in Hotchkiss's voice, so I uh, hope she lives up to your memory. <laughs> so hello, Professor Hotchkiss. It is so nice to meet you. How are you doing today? Oh, hello, Tammy. I'm just wonderful. Thank you very much. You know, the last time we heard from you was during the Tomb of the Lost Queen, and Nancy was in Egypt, and, you know, you're always working on a new book or a new project. You know, is there a new topic on the table that you are just crazy about? Maybe a new historical figure, like, uh, other than Marie Antoinette? Oh, Marie Antoinette is very, very difficult to forget. Don't you see that, Tammy? But I have had to move on. Uh, because you don't want to stay and get obsessed about anything. But I actually, I'm looking back at biblical characters now, and um, I am, you know, really wanting to look into um, who Jesus really was as a fellow. I feel like um, he is uh, a character I want to see as um, he was a leader, wanted to help the poor. He also wanted to. Uh, he's both religious and secular, so I find him very fascinating. So he is my latest research topic. And, and you know, one of my favorite things about you is that you adore food, just like me. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. In your yeah. opinion, what is the perfect meal? Because you've traveled the world, you've seen it all, and you've probably had so many different meals. What is the perfect meal to you? Oh, well... When you're talking about perfect meals, there really is nothing better than sticking with the Greeks. Because for me, I love the refreshing taste of lemon on my palate. So I would like to start my perfect meal with um, a, a little bowl of Agbo Lemona soup, which is lemon and chicken and little garlic and rice and Oh, you can't forget the eggs. But uh, all sounding like very ordinary ingredients, but you put them together, Tammy. And they are divine. Um, uh, and then, of course, I would move on to uh, some kind of uh, very garlicky chicken. Um, so you really can't go wrong with those ingredients for me. I, you know, I really feel like I um, have traveled the world, as you said, and I on occasion like Thai food and Chinese food but really right now I'm sticking with the Greeks if I ever have a dessert it really is uh, just a little tablespoon of chocolate ice cream at the end of the night and that is just enough and I don't need a lot of flavor before I go to bed <laughs> well you are a wonderful author and I feel that the stage may be calling your name you know would you ever consider being a playwright or an actress it's true I, mean, I think I'm blushing now you can't see that but I, I <laughs> do feel like the stage calls my name and uh, although I've been a wonderful audience member over the years I I have often watched a performance and thought, well, let Hotchkiss take over there. Hotchkiss can show you how to do that. But uh, well, there are very few roles I want to play, but I do think, don't you, that maybe a revival of Auntie Mame should be in my future. Now, what do you think about turning uh, a, one of our favorite television shows in all of history into a new stage musical? But I think I could star in the musical of Murder, She Wrote. These are really good ideas. I need to write these down because I would love to see a Murder, She Wrote musical. Angela Lansbury is my favorite. Oh, please do write to your local producers and tell them that I am available. Well, I love one of your quotes. It's one of my favorites, and I thought we'd end our interview with this quote. You know, you always said, if life were a good book, 
you would be my favorite reoccurring character. And really, Professor Hotchkiss, you are my favorite reoccurring character in the series. So I really hope we get to see you again with Nancy sometime soon. Well, that's very flattering, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tammy, for caring about these stories and for stories in general. And scene. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, I guess she's been buried beneath me all this, this time. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> I, lo- I, I really do aspire to be Professor Hotchkiss. Not really care what anybody thinks, but really enjoy life. So I love that character. <laughs> yeah, I think she's a beacon for all of us. <laughs> Truly. And, and my final question is, if you could describe your experience working with Her Interactive and being a part of the Nancy Drew universe using one word, what would it be? Well, it's really trite, but I'm going to say fun. Um, I mean, if that's your job to go in and do voices and, uh, you know, really get to stretch yourself as an actor and, and be part of stories that people care about, it's fun. It, there's, there was, you know, there's work involved, obviously, but it's, it's much more playtime. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so much fun, Carrie, and I and I really do hope we have you back on the show soon. <laughs> thank you for thinking of me, and this has been delightful. Thanks so much, Tammy. <laughs>